Good morning. Welcome to the first in a series of 10 talks, which will extend into the spring of next year, 2021. So my name is Nicole Von Germanten. I'm a history professor here at Oregon State University, and I'm the director of the School of History, Philosophy, and Religious Studies at OSU. Um, it's a great honor to be here with all of you and with our visitor, Professor Mitchell Jackson. Um, this is a talk series, uh, the first of 10 talks, that takes the name Cabildos. This refers to a very popular and widespread type of organization found in many far-flung locations from Lisbon, Portugal, to Central Africa, Cuba, and Brazil, and similar organizations all around the Americas. Cabildos and, and um, other organizations of this kind were community groups that gathered Africans and their descendants to help with health care, social ties, and foster African diaspora spirituality and identity for almost 600 years now, since the mid 1400s. And this all took place around what we as historians and other scholars call the Black Atlantic. Cabildos also supported the creation of new African diaspora political identities and played a role in fostering rebellions and insurgency. This broader history shapes our world today, including in the United States, which is part of the African diaspora and is part of the Black Atlantic, along with dozens of other countries. In this sphere, series, which is sponsored by donations to OSU's history program, we turn our podium to junior scholars, writers, and historians and political scientists. <clears throat> The series was created to address the crises we are now experiencing in our country. Historians know that these are not new develops, developments, and so do the people who are involved in them. As a white professor myself, it's my turn to step back and listen to these experts that are speaking to us, uh, which we're grateful to have them. All of our speakers in this series combine their scholarship with advocacy and activism. And it's really important, I think, that we sit back and listen to their stories and their perspectives. So if you want to please stay until the end of this um, presentation, then you'll see a list of our upcoming speakers, um, which continue through this fall. In the next uh, four weeks or so, we have another three speakers that are all speaking on really relevant um, situations going on now that relate to their scholarship and their uh, activism. So today's speaker comes to us with the help and sponsorship of, um, again, our donors to our history program, as well as uh, the School of Writing, Literature, and Film at OSU and the College of Liberal Arts. Um, in this presentation, history professors Marisa Chappelle and Joel Zapata will take over uh, to introduce our distinguished guest and then continue to interview him with possible opportunities for audience questions so um, I will turn it over now to Professor Marisa Chappelle, who, are, uh, who will introduce our distinguished guest, the award-winning author um, and professor in the Master of Fine Arts program at the University of Chicago, um, Professor Mitchell Jackson. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I want to I want to uh, make sure everybody knows that closed captioning is available for this program. You can see the link for that in the chat box. I also, before I introduce uh, Mitchell S. Jackson, I want to give a land acknowledgement. Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon is located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's Riv River or Ampanepu Band of the Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, living descendants of these people are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon, and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. Now I will turn to Mitchell S. Jackson, who we are absolutely thrilled and honored to have with us today. Mitchell S. Jackson is an award-winning author and public speaker who grew up in Portland, Oregon. His first novel, The Residue Years, won the Ernest J. Gaines Prize for Literary Excellence and was the finalist for the Center for Fiction Flaherty Dunnan First Novel Prize, the Penn Hemingway Award for Debut Fiction, and the Hurston Wright Legacy Award. 
Jackson has also won a Whiting Award and has held fellowships from the New York Public Library's Coleman Center, the Lannan Foundation, the Ford Foundation, PEN America, TED, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and the Center for Fiction. His nonfiction book, Survival Math, Notes on an All-American Family, published spring of last year, was named a best book of the year by 15 publications, including NPR Time, The Paris Review, The Root, Kirkus Reviews, and BuzzFeed. And if I go through all of the honors, uh, we won't have time for the interview. So um, for those who haven't read any of his writing, I wanted to give you a very small sense of its power, but I really lack the eloquence. So I turned to some reviewers for help. Roxanne Gay in the New York Times describes the residue years as having a spoken word cadence the language flying off the page with percussive energy. And of survival math, Erica Taylor writes, while never shrinking from the various harms his family members inflict on themselves and each other, Jackson consistently writes about them and truly all the people we encounter from a place of grace. She also notes his attentiveness to providing historical context for the forces shaping his family members and the places they call home. Jackson's writing has been featured in the New York Times Book Review, Time, The New Yorker, on and on and on. Uh, he is a contributing writer to Esquire, and I highly recommend his uh, piece from June on Ahmaud Arbery in, the, in Runner's World. He is also a sought after speaker, social justice advocate, and teaches creative writing at the University of Chicago. It's my, seriously my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Mitchell S. Jackson, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Hoyle Zapata and to Mitchell Jackson for their conversation. Uh, Mitchell, first I want to thank you for being here with us, and I'm so glad to have you in Oregon, even remotely. In both of your books, you make sense of where you came from, from Oregon, from Portland, and more specifically Northeast Portland. In survival, survival Math, you take a deep dive into the past to make sense of both the state and its people and your own life. And as a historian, I want to note that uh, in your second book, Survival Math, you write that history beautifully. You take a deep dive into the place where you came from and you humanize each character you touch upon. And I, I wanted you to read a section from your book um, that touches on that history. Uh, so, so I'm going to start with reading uh, something from Dear Marcus. Um, Marcus Lopez or Lopez was the um, first person of African descent on record to step foot in what became Oregon, and uh, he was killed by some natives uh, the day that he arrived. Um, and finding out about that history from Professor Daryl Milner is really how I found it, who was a historian at Portland State University, who I have to really give credit to um, really moved me to start exploring uh, the, the history of black people in uh, Oregon. So I'm starting kind of uh, further into this. Um, it's a letter, but it's also uh, this uh, epistolary um, essay. Um, <clears throat> this one starts with uh, talking about uh, York who was traveling, the black man who was traveling with the Lewis and Clark expedition. York is damn near mythic for his time as Clark's indispensable manservant slave. We should feel proud of the tales of him whipsawing thick ass logs at Camp Du Bois, hefting supplies no one else could, flexing his superior skills as honey buffalo, geese, brants, being chosen to share his big medicine with native women who believed him a dark skinned and nappy headed wonder. York helped the corpse map out part of the Oregon Trail in those pre-Civil War days when they called this place the Oregon Country. Oregon being a name anointed in 1822 by the Florida congressman who proposed a bill to incorporate this area as a territory. In the Oregon Country, owning slaves long-term was outlawed. However, the autonomous provisional government passing a last law, ephemeral though it was, confirms those Oregon pioneers were still anti-us. Blacks in Oregon, quote, Blacks in Oregon, be they free or slave, will be whipped twice a year until he or she shall quit the territory, end quote. Congress at last voted into existence the Oregon Territory in 1848 and elected a new provisional government, or rather, more, willing, more men willing themselves 
white, who believed with just the right statutes, one of which was our exclusion, this land could become their paradise. Marcus, had you lived long enough to instead immigrate to this paradisical place post the repeal of its initial exclusion law, you would have been subject to laws that forbade you voting or acquiring free land or ordained coupling with any white soul. Who could and couldn't come, who could or couldn't stay was tough, tough talk, though praise it amounted to but one expulsion. <clears throat> that hapless victim was a fair skinned man named Jacob Vanderpool. Picture Vanderpool dressed impeccable in a checkered vest and tailored trousers and buck white shirt with his silk white bow tie just so. Him buzzing around his boarding house saloon restaurant when the sheriff showed up to arrest him because a local white business owner condemned him in violation of the exclusion law. Pitcher Vanderpool's lawyer soon thereafter arguing the charge against his client was out and out unconstitutional. Picture the prosecutor calling witnesses, none of whom can say for a fact when this not light-skinned enough black man arrived in their midst and the judge delivering his verdict, quote, I being satisfied that the same Jacob Vanderpool is a mulatto and that he is remaining in the territory of Oregon contrary to the statutes and laws of the territory, do therefore order that the said Jacob Vanderpool remove from said territory within 30 days from and upon the service of this order. That said order be served by showing to the said Jacob Vanderpool this original and at the same time delivering to him a true copy of the same." End quote. Imagine that sheriff serving Vanderpool the verdict at his boarding house saloon restaurant the same day it was a judge and that judgment quavering in Vanderpool's hands as he read it again and again and worried over delivering the news to his workers and finding a state, a city, a people that would accept him. Imagine Vanderpool, a symbol for Oregon's colored folk for decades to come, packing all that he could over the next few days and striking off quiet and stealthy from a white man's land. Seventy or so miles lie between the beach village where you drew your last breath and the curious city where I drew my first. A city birthed with men surnamed Lovejoy and Overton, fast friends canoeing the Willamette from Oregon City, docked near a well-known grove of trees called the Clearing. In my mind, the men hopped out, swank inland, turned their hands to visors against a majestic sun, prospect as far as their blue eyes could see and proclaim their to their munificent God, this should be ours. In the next months, they cleared more land, built more structures, laid out plans. Within a year, though, a flood hit and spooked Overson into selling his stake and the claim to a man surnamed Pettigrove. Per the lore, both Lovejoy and Pettigrove wanted to christen the settlement after the New England city they hailed from and thrice flipped a copper penny that decided Portland it would be. Portland cityhood preceded Oregon statehood, which Congress granted on Valentine's Day in 1859. Should you have lived into your 90s and tried to settle in this nascent state, you would have discovered how unloved, unwelcome, and unsecured you were, would have found every bit of you opposed by its exclusion law. The lone legislation of its kind for states admitted into the union, quote, no free Negro or mulatto, not residing in this state at the time of the adoption of this constitution shall come reside or be within this state or hold any real estate or make any contracts or maintain any suit therein and the legislative assembly shall provide by penal laws for the removal by public officers of all such Negroes and mulattoes and for the effectual exclusion from the state and for the punishment of persons who shall bring them into the state or employ or harbor them." End quote. In the history of Oregon, our folks have numbered most years less than 5% of its residents 
So it shouldn't be no big old surprise that in the 1920s, the second coming of the KKK flourished in this blanched state and its cities. Here's proof. One summer night, the Portland Clavering goaded reporters and civic leaders to a meeting into a hotel with the cryptic message, learn something to your advantage. Once the invited guests arrived, Klan members ushered them out of the hotel and into cars that chauffeured them to a secret throne room, where reporters with box cameras and pens and notepads and a pair of Klansmen in full regalia awaited them. That evening, the Klan argued they weren't a hate group, that they'd be a powerful ally to the friends of, quote, law and order. To close, to close the meeting, the King Kligo, a southern transplant who believed the state a monolithic promised land for his ilk, offered an ominous warning, quote, respect for the law and the working of a small army of unofficial detectives who will work with the constituted law are the marks of the Klan character. These are some, there are some cases, of course, in which we will have to take everything into our hands. Some crimes are not punishable under existing laws, but criminals should be punished." Close quote. That next day, the papers ran a photo that featured the exalted Cyclops and King Kligo in their gleaming white glory suits beside dark-suited attendees which included the chief and captain of police, a sheriff, the U.S. District Attorney and State District Attorney, reps for the Justice Department and National Safety Council, even the mayor. That winter of 1922, the Klan held its first public meeting and lured thousands of curious Portlanders into the municipal auditorium for a keynote speech titled, The Truth About the Invisible Empire, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Marcus, while the Klan flourished in the 1920s, so did we. Much credit due to the Golden West Hotel, the nexus of our social life in the city, which ain't me in the least dismissing the Freeman Secondhand Store, Rutherford Her Herberdashery, Barbershop, Cigar and Confectionery Store, or the Egyptian Theater, despite folks who look like us being forced to sit in the balcony, no matter how many seats sat empty below. A couple of decades later, the city's infinitesimal black community boasted activ activists like Otto and Verdell Rutherford, who from the 40s to the 60s turned their living room into a virtual mimeograph factory for the NAACP. It also included members of the NACW who once protested for the hiring of black postal workers. It came to include indefatigable members of the National Urban League and the Black United Front. And best believe we needed every single one of them. Back then, Portland was a place where one of us might be searching for a Sunday brunch or a dinner spot and be confronted by a whites only or we cater to whites only trade sentiments we'd hope we'd escaped. In this state, in this city, there ain't no escaping the gray. In days of rain, 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 there was a time when we couldn't escape redlining either. Or in other words, the Portland Realty Board's corrupt code of ethics, edits that forbade realtors and bankers from selling us homes in prime neighborhoods for fear we'd plunge their worth. And should we forget our sanction limits. Bold ass bigots would spike hand drawn posters on their lawn. Quote, we want white tenants in our white community. We want white tenants in our neighborhood, end quote, to remind us. Scores of us can trace our roots in this city, the Rose City, to the 1940s, when one of our kinfolk from down south peeped to help want an ad in their hometown paper packed their life into bags and or suitcases and caught boxcars called Magic City Carpet or Kaiser Caravan into Portland for a chance to build new life working in one of Henry Kaiser's shipyards. 
Those relatives locomoted into the city of roses and found a hovel or shacked up with friends or relatives, or in some cases slept on the pool table of a tavern and washed their private parts in a squalid bathroom, or else moved to a slapdash development dubbed Kaiserville and renamed Vanport City. No matter the shelter they found, they could feel gratified building liberty ships that would help the Allies beat the Nazis while clocking more dough for work than they ever did where they came from. Uh, I'll stop there. We in the 1940s with the Vanport flood. Mitch, thank you for that reading. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions about it. Um, first, you start survival math with the long-term history of Oregon, the place where you're from. Uh, how did that long-term history affect your upbringing? And how did it influence and shape the lives of the women and men that you write about in your books? And, and why did you start with the history that goes so far um, back? Well, uh, I think I really owe it to um, the, if I trace survival math back um, to its genesis, it was an essay that I wrote for um, Salon Magazine. It must have been almost over 10 years ago now. And uh, I wrote an essay about my um, kind of encounters with violent people. And uh, I sent the essay in and I titled it uh, Survival Math, I, which I thought was a great title. Clearly I named the book after it 10 years later. Uh, but they retitled, Salon Magazine retitled that essay, Growing Up Black in the Whitest City in America. And uh, Though I had grown up in Portland all of my life, hadn't moved away uh, until I was in my 20s, um, the fact of them pointing that out to me was almost a revelation um, because I knew it was white, but it was, it, it was like air. You know, the whiteness in Portland was air to me and everyone that I grew up with. And so once they said that, it also pointed me towards investigating why and how it became the whitest city in America. So I really owe Salon Magazine for retitling that. And I think um, for me and for the people that I grew up around, it was the same thing. Like the whiteness just becomes really like, you know, an element that we are just used to kind of navigating. We don't, we don't even realize it. Um, but we do know if you kind of, and back then it was Northeast Portland, but if you moved outside of Northeast Portland, those boundaries that you would encounter it in a way that was not elemental anymore, that it would be more kind of uh, explicit. Well, following up on that, I was wondering if you could tell us how that history, how that history of whiteness mm -hmm. influences not only black people living in Portland, but also the white people living in Portland, the majority of the city, how that history, mm -hmm. especially you could probably tell us the difference that you notice moving to New York City or Chicago now and coming back home. Yeah, well, I think um, it 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 really the the founders of Oregon uh, and Portland. Um, I think they did a really good job, uh, a great job actually, because the the precedent that they set for how Oregon would look has not changed since its founding. Right, like it's it's really been a white monolith all of these years. Um, and I think the kind of adversarial position of the majority towards people of color and especially to black people has really uh, been the kind of, it sustained itself for all of these years. Um, and I also think that there is something to people who migrate to Portland who are white because they know that they're coming to a monolith, right? So if you if you if you go, I guess there are people who just happen to move to Oregon and don't know anything about it. But the people who I think are making reasonably kind of informed judgments, they are deciding to move to a white monolith. So I often wonder about what kind of person wants to live in a monolith versus, you know, if I move to Chicago or if there are neighborhoods obviously through redlining and all these other things that are segregated but it's a it's it's not just a kind of pure it's not so much of a monolith and, and obviously in new york city 
that isn't the case as well. But um, yeah, it makes it makes me really curious about the kind of people that move there and what are they really after um, when they get there, which also, you know, brings us kind of to the current moment where so many of the people who are involved in the kind of current protests are people who migrated to Portland. Uh, and I don't wanna, I don't think it's an overwhelming number, but I think enough to be um, to kind of call that into question, like they moved here for into a place where they knew there was going to be a monolith, but now here they are fighting for, you know, justice for the group that has been habitually oppressed in this same place. Um, so there's all kind of like uh, ironies, I think, involved in Portland. Uh, thank you for that. I, it, the conversation went in places as didn't expect, and I'll have to email you with more questions. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we have enough time to finish all of them. But I did want to move on to how your book uh, makes clear that Black people have been part of Oregon, even if they've never been a large percentage of this state and part of America from its foundations. Uh, and that's something, especially when we hear the story of Americans moving West that we hardly yeah. ever hear, the other people, the non-white people that were part of this whole movement. So meaning just like white Americans moved throughout the continent, so did Black people and moved to the Pacific Northwest to Oregon. You touch on your own family origins in Alabama and your family's story of moving to Oregon in 1959 within Survival Map. Can you tell us about your grandparents and great-grandparents in Alabama and why they moved to Portland and what they were seeking and did they find what they were looking for? Yeah. Um... Well, my family moving from Alabama to um, to Oregon started with my great grandmother. Um, her name is Edith Jackson, and she was a school teacher. She actually attended. Um, I mean, it's sometimes just called the very first, but it's the very first black university in Alabama. Um, it's had several different names, but uh, her and all of her sisters went uh, to school for education, which was one of the things that you could do as a black person in those days. Um, and she, I don't know who was here first, I think maybe a great aunt, but she came to visit a great aunt in Oregon and she loved uh, the city. And um, she also was really enamored with the opportunity to integrate Portland public schools. So she called my great grandfather and told him that they were moving. Um, and uh, she was very forceful uh, or, or very convincing and or convincing. And so they moved. Um, and yeah, she came here and she worked in Portland Public Schools for a very long time. Um, I think that her case is probably, I mean, it's different because they, she comes from relative wealth, like in the black community, like her, her family were landowners in Alabama, they still have like streets named after them. They, uh, so she wasn't necessarily moving because she was impoverished and chasing like this idea of the American dream. She actually came here because she uh, was really, it's, it was more like a pre or not even pre, like a civil rights um, uh, objective. Interesting, well, I, I would say that that is, at least I would hope it is a form of the American dream. Uh, even if oh, it's yeah, not definitely. Civil rights, absolutely. But it, it's not like, you know, bootstrapping the, yeah. you know, buy a home. <laughs> uh, something that I found really interesting about your family story, uh, especially in the book section that you titled Exodus, is the lore behind it, uh, where you had different narratives of your family. Some of them didn't necessarily agree of why they came, how they came. Could you touch more of this family lore that you have behind it, which is so interesting because that's so coming among any ethnicity or race or any family that's moving out west or moving anywhere in the world, that there's always disagreement in lures about what the actual truth is. Yeah, I mean, I think because, you know, African culture is uh, first an oral culture. And I think that that, um, that value system it came across, you know, the Atlantic with us and was surely a part of, um, you know, um, antebellum uh, South. And I think that uh, we are just, I'll just speak for myself. I don't want to say that I'm speaking for all black people. In my family, we have great storytellers, particularly a lot of the men 
they're not that they're better storytellers, but they just take up more of the storytelling space in the family. And I think that, you know, if you tell a story long enough, it, it everything becomes mythologized, right? And I think uh, maybe that's the job of the historian is to separate what is the myth from what is the actual fact. But in the in the story, I mean, in the family, I think we don't too much mind the lore. It it actually emboldens you and makes you feel like you're part of something special. So, you know, I I retell how many points I averaged in my last. Uh, year playing college basketball over and over and every year I give myself 0.5 points more per game so you know like by the time I'm 50 I will have averaged 30 points per game and it's you know it's we're, we're in the ballpark but I think I am I, I'm conscious of this kind of creating a mythology and creating a lore but I also think for people who are historically disenfranchised that we need that mythology maybe even more than people who are like you know in better position than us because because you have to believe in more than what you're actually seeing you have to believe sometimes in more than what the actual historical record shows you um oftentimes i guess because we're excluded from that historical record too i completely agree and thinking about my own family movement to the united states from mexico uh there's so much that is left out in the family lore to hide the yeah. painful parts so i'm sure you had to do a lot of digging to find the more painful yeah. aspects um, so what do you think your broader family was trying to find in Oregon, whether it's your great aunt who got here first, your mm -hmm. grandma, uh, who came to integrate the city, um, and did they find what they were looking for ultimately? Uh, well, I think what they were looking for was escape from the South. I mean, I can't imagine growing up in Jim Crow South, much less pre Jim Crow South, which all of them, my great grandparents were pre Jim Crow or no, they were Jim Crow South. So um, I think that Oregon at least presented itself like it does now as a place where the white majority was a little more uh, accepting of the black presence, you know, as long as they could still coerce it in the ways that they needed to coerce it. I don't think that many of them found, oh, that's not true. I do think my great grandmother found what she was looking for. I mean, she had many children. Um, she owned a home. She was the, you know, the kind of the, the trunk of the family. Uh, she taught for a very long time. She was a pillar in her church. So I think in that sense, like she lived the kind of life for her period that was really exempl exemplary. I mean, she did suffer a lot of heartache with my uncles and their addiction and going to prison and my aunt being murdered and all of that. So there was, you know, it, it wasn't without its harms, but I think that she got what she was after. Um, I think for most of my family, we didn't. Um, I had a, um, a an uncle pass, uh, see, he, he passed last month. Um, and he, I write about him in Exodus too, this is my uncle Henry. Uh, who's like a myth to me. Um, so he was a guy who in the, I think it was like 1980s, uh, this, it was a, it's now defunct Oregon Magazine, but he had got arrested for um, selling drugs. And it said, uh, um, Superman goes to jail. It's like Oregon's biggest drug dealer um, goes to jail. And it, it was talking about like, he had like a Rolls Royce and he had bought a plane and he had done all of these things which made him, and these are the stories that we were told when we were growing up. You know, your uncle used to own a plane and he, but for all of my life that I could remember, he was like an addict. Um, so I think there's the part of him is like, yeah, you got what you came for where you had a, you had a moment to kind of live this life. And I think the rest of it is like a lot of heartache. And I think that's probably for most of my family It's you know, we get a kind of, we get a preview or just, you know, just ephemeral moment where it feels like we're li really living. And then the rest of it is a lot of negotiating uh, survival. Definitely. Well, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you to do a second reading from Survival Math uh, to get at the makeup of the community that <laughs> you, you lived in and, uh, and then afterwards touch on how it was before or 
what you think of its current state. Okay. Uh, let me see here. Mark this. Uh, all right. So this is the end of that same chapter, which I don't think I set it up properly in the beginning. This is a letter to Marcus, that first black man, a hypothetical letter to Marcus, the first black man who ever stepped foot on what became Oregon. So I'm trying to explain to the forefather of all Oregon blacks what has happened to his people since he perished. Uh, and this is the end of that letter. Marcus, I'll close soon. But before I do, I must tell you about this not so long ago day I cruised the arteries of this new city, Alberta, Mississippi, Williams Ave, saw on Alberta a staffing company and a yoga studio and restaurant bars, saw cheery citizens lunching on a patio under the shade of tall trees and a vacant lot transformed into a scaled metropolis of food trucks. There was a clothing store and a bike shop and a sticker shop and a donut shop and a place that fixes guitars. That day I rode up and down Mississippi and saw a tattoo shop and a tea shop and an art gallery and a bookstore. Witnessed a shabby dude, the lone brown face for blocks in any direction, flitting to destination somewhere. Saw a cafe that sells crepes and a boutique that hawks high-end glasses while wheeling the wide berth of an interminable ass bike lane. I peeked a dude on a mountain bike in khakis and an Oxford shirt and a woman tattooed in plural on a cruiser. Every few feet or so it seemed, construction crews were erecting odes to privilege. On Williams Ave, I beheld more miles of bike lanes and bike shops and bikers in the bike bar. There was an Art Deco hospital building under construction and a bakery and a hair studio and a Pilates studio and yet another damn yoga studio. There was a mother pushing a hooded stroller and a couple trapsing the sidewalk hand in hand as if this world would never fail them. But what I didn't see on Williams Ave was a single black face any which way my head turned. Our absence made me question whether this new city is the yield of what they've sown or what we've reaped. It made me wonder if it's our just due from surrendering our hope too soon or dreaming pragmatic or mashing on somebody's baby girl all winter to glory new wheels down MLK and majestic summer brilliance or being enchanted with colors or transforming from one gang to the other or copying a dope sack on consignment from a head start on prison big homie and posting all night on a dim side street for a few bucks, if even a buck, of profit or seizing with a strap what don't belong to us or flouting a second or third strike and revolving to prison to serve a mandatory minimum stretch, I ask myself, could this new place, home, which seems so much the locus of our undoing, be the harvest of our collective deeds? The answer is yes. But the answer is also that you and me and the generations between and beyond us must refuse assuming the greatest weight for what this place has become. Because if these centuries attest to anything, is to the incontrovertible truth that this ain't our Eden and won't be, for that was never their intent. Thank you for that. I found that to be one of the most powerful uh, paragraphs about gentrification that I've read in a long time, if not ever. Mm. And I did want to get at, yes, this is the current makeup of the community you grew up in, or at least part of it. Can you describe to us a little bit how the community looked like when you were living there uh, before you left Portland or while you were growing up? Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was really a, a community. Um, there were places where we, you knew where you could go and find people, um, like touch, uh, like uh, places like uh, Irving Park, uh, you knew on a Saturday or a Sunday, you could go there and find just about anybody who loved to play sports was on that basketball court. 
on a Saturday or Sunday. Um, you knew uh, if you were looking for somewhere to go on a Saturday night, you could go to Alberta to the Texan. Um, you knew, uh, you know, there was, if you were going school shopping, you were going to the Lloyd Center because you, you know, everywhere else was too far away. Um, and also it still felt like the kind of community where you would see someone and you would see an adult and they would know you and or know your father and know your uncle uh, and people who you wouldn't even know and say like, you know, I went to school with your uncle. Uh, and, and you would feel that kind of community kind of child rearing. Um, and I think that that really started to change in the mid eighties when, uh, you know, when, when crack came through and people's aunts and uncles were, you know, wandering around the neighborhood now looking for, you know, a crack house. Uh, so that's where the safety of the community started to, it really, it, 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 it diminished very quickly. Um, but it, it was still, you know, you had to also negotiate that these same people who were now on drugs and these same people who were selling drugs were still the same, they were still connected in the same ways, right? So you would be, I remember being in a, in a house um, on Williams Ave, right close to where I was writing about now, where this young guy was selling drugs crack to his mom. And I just remember thinking like that it, to me is like the lowest point for a person in our community to be able to like, to look your mom in the eye and give her something that you know is destroying her. Um, and they didn't have any furniture in the house. And there were just all of these things. And I was like, wow, this is, this is, this is the same place where we would like all, you know, get on our bikes and ride on the handlebars over to the park and play basketball and things had really changed. Uh, so, uh, and then I remember in the early 2000s when, you know, white guys are walking around the neighborhood with clipboards asking us, you know, do you want to sell your home? <laughs> uh, which, which, you know, got it going. Wow. So in all these, all these different eras that you touch on, whether it's the seventies or eighties or even the two thousands, uh, you really touch on your grandparents' house on Sixth and Mason or great grandparents' house. And that house was almost like a character in your book. Uh, independent of the people. I'm, and I, I love that part of it, um, how you touch on that place so much. Um, what does that house signify to you? Um, I mean, uh, there's a Toni Morrison essay on home, and she says, home is your memory of a place and the people around it. And to me, that home on uh, six. Sixth and Mason in Northeast Portland is my, when I think of home, it's my most vivid memory of home. Um, and uh, it also, and maybe it's a, a part of the reason why it's that way is because we were so uh, peripatetic when I was young. So we were always like here and there and here, but we always knew that my grandmother was never, great grandmother was never going to move. Uh, so we can always come back there. So. So it was really important to have a home base for people who were being forced or putting ourselves in situations where we had to constantly move. Um, and, and yeah, you just, you get to know, you know, you get to know which cabinet might have a mouse roaming in it. You get to know, you know, where the, the wallpaper is peeling. You get to know if you swing on this pipe, it's going to burst on you. And, you know, so all of those things I can, I actually went into that house when I was filming my documentary and the people who owned it, this must have been 15, 20 years later after my grandparents had sold it, let me walk around in the home. And I every every room that I walked into, I had a memory, a very vivid memory of being in that room and what had happened to it. And I could see it, they had redecorated obviously, but I could see it as it was in 1982 or 19, you know, 89. Um, and that's really important to me to have a place that grounds me, um, even while I move around the world. And now I'm in Chicago and I was in New York for 15, 16 years or longer. Um, I've never considered any other place home. I've actually never, ever written about New York. So all, the whole 16 years I was in New York, I only wrote about Oregon. So you still very much consider Oregon. And even if your family doesn't own that house anymore, you still consider that home 
your actual yeah. home, Northeast Portland, your yeah. actual home. Every once in a while, I look on the market and see it's up for sale, you know, but it, it keeps going up. It's six bedrooms in Northeast Portland, so y'all know what the real estate market is right now. So one day, one day. <laughs> so when you visit Northeast Portland, especially when you visit your your family home that's no longer part of your family, uh, at least not at least not in an ownership way, mm -hmm. what goes through your head when you see everyone walking around your community that doesn't look like you necessarily, that doesn't have the same life experiences of the people you grew up with? Um, do you ever think about if they think about the people that were there before them or if they consider what happened to the community? Um, well, I, uh, well, when I'm walking around, not I, I don't think that, I think that, that because the people who are there now, if they're new, they're building a concept of home, right? So they have to create those memories which are going to anchor them to that place. Um, so 20, 30 years from now, their memories will be much different than mine, but hopefully if they stay, you know, they'll, they'll, have, they'll have a sense of home. I was very thankful to the people who I encountered who lived in the home. I don't know if they still own it, but um, when I went in there, there was one thing that they had found, which was uh, it was a window in the kitchen and it had been inscribed with King, uh, the name King. And they, they had done some research and found out that in the uh, in those, I guess it was maybe the 1930s or something, they would inscribe the windows with the, own, with the name of the person who owned it. And that home is in the King neighborhood. So the person who uh who the neighborhood is named after used to live in my grandmother's home before it was her home so that made me even feel more connected to the i went to king's king school as a child which is right up the street from that home and to know that the person who uh this neighborhood was named after um was really like gratifying to me and made me feel more connected to this place um and there are still people there you know people who just would never sell their place, right? So there are still a few people there who are the, the 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 sons and daughters of people who were on the block, been on the block since you know the 60s. Um, so I appreciate that and that 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 willfulness to caretake a neighborhood, to say no, this is a place that we we have roots here and we want to stay here, no matter what the kind of you know financial lures are, but that you you stay because you know, you you set down this place and you're connected to it in a way that people who just kind of move in fresh won't be. You know, if you think about people who are using real estate as a investment, who come and live in a place for five or six years, it's never home, right? Like it's just a place, it's a domicile for you, but you don't, you don't set down the same roots. And I would imagine it doesn't mean the same place to you. And I think that that was one thing about my grandparents generation is that they were setting down roots for a home probably because they had come from a place that were they were they were rooted there because they had to be and now they were able to set down a place uh where they could make a place that they wanted to be thank you for that um before we open up the conversation to all the audience members i did want to ask you uh why you titled your second book survival math and what survival math means, and what are the survival files that you have within the book? Okay. Um, I mean, survival math really comes out of my experience in the 1990s, maybe late 80s, early 90s, where I said the neighborhood, when crack came in, people in my generation, so I'm 45 now, uh, it went from making a little money to then gangs came in and then it, everything got violent. And I was never a gang member. I did start to sell drugs in high school and then really when I got out of high school. And because I was a nice guy, I was also a, a, a target too often of people who were willing to go you know, to greater lengths to get what they wanted. And so survival map was really me trying to navigate what was a fraught and violent era of Portland and it is now in Portland a much I don't know how much but it's 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 surpassed the violence and the fraughtness 
uh, is surpassed what was happening in that era. And that says a lot. Um, so yeah, so survival math is really the calculations that I would make when I would like see a guy in a restaurant who had pulled a gun on me and I would have to decide, do I want to eat this, you know, uh, low chow main or do I want to leave? Or when a guy pulls a pistol on me and asks me, do we got a problem? Like, do I say, yeah, we got a problem or don't I? Uh, so my kind of textbook definition is survival math are the kind of on the spot calculus that you have to make when you're faced with a mortal threat. Um, and then the, the, the second part of the question was what? If you could tell us a little bit about the survival oh, files. The survival files. Uh, and I see um, you have a picture of the people you touch on behind you. Yeah, I got some, my partner got some artwork made for me uh, of the, the hard, hard cover. Um, so survival files was me thinking of this book in terms of not just a memoir. I never conceived it as a memoir, though many people read it as such. I thought of it as an essay collection and I thought of it also as a kind of community history. And so while I had already been thinking about the survival stories that I had had, I was also concerned with the survival stories of other men in my family. And I was particularly concerned with the men because when I conceived of them, it was near um, the kind of inception of Black Lives Matter. So if you all remember Trayvon Martin and how they were saying that he looked dangerous because he had the hoodie and then there was Mike Brown and he looked hulking, like all of these black men were being trade is very dangerous. And I wanted to challenge that idea of a black man looking dangerous. So, uh, and also to investigate survival stories of people that were close to me. So I asked 15, 16 men in my family to sit down with me and share a survival story. I told them the concept, but I also took a photo of them. And my objective was to decontextualize them. So I, I took, I made them all wear black t-shirts. I shot them all the same. I framed them all the same. I told them to take off any kind of jewelry. I really wanted to say, okay, if I take everything away from this black man, what is it that you see in his face that makes him dangerous? Um, and then I asked them all the same question, which was, what's the toughest thing you survived? And uh, I wrote their stories to me in a second person narrative, because I also thought that people would be reading this book who had very disparate um, experiences and I wanted to give them access to it in a way that I thought a third person would 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 do. Uh, I wanted to kind of collapse the emotional distance and psychic distance between the reader and this experience. And so that's why I wrote them in second person. I also wanted to give them anonymity. So in the book, I never say which story belongs to which person, which is an invitation for the reader to look at the image, read the stories, look at the images and read the stories and then try to put them together and then ask yourself, why, how am I making these decisions? What kind of implicit biases are informing my decision to say this story belongs to this particular person? Um, and to me, that is a conversation that's very much a part of this kind of Black Lives Matter conversation, right? Like what is it that you are seeing in these people that make them look dangerous? What is it that you see in them that makes you think that, you know, a woman sleeping does not deserve, you know, justice. Thank you for those words. Um, I do want to open up the conversation to the audience. And if you have any questions, um, are, are we doing it through chat? Is that correct? No, through the Q&A tool down at the bottom of their okay. so if you the have Q&A button and submit it that way. Thank you. If you have any questions, please drop it into the Q&A button and I will fill them in for you. Okay, what well, people are writing any questions? I did, you, you touched on one really enthralling part of your book and so telling of today's society across the country, not just Portland, it's you talked about your mom donating plasma and how that supplemented her income at times that made up most of her income. Uh, and you, I had never, I've, oh, I had, when I was in college, I saw a lot of my friends donating plasma, 
because when you're in college, you need sometimes money to dress to eat. Um, mm -hmm. And that's becoming more prevalent. But you did a history of this of blood donation. You did a history of how there was segregation within blood donations and there was an, an apartheid of blood is what you called it, really powerful. Uh, if you could tell us about your findings in this history of not only plasma donations, but just even blood donations, and especially yeah. one of the, uh, you really touch on one of the figures that was centered to making this possible in the United States. Yeah. Um, well, I was saying that every one of these essays started with something personal. So that is the memoir aspect of it. Uh, I would be so frustrated with my mother for going to donate blood uh, and and year after year would say like, please don't do it. Why are you doing this? And explain it to me. And, uh, and then when I started to write about it, um, I actually obviously went to a center and, and I didn't go through the process of actually donating, but just went in there and, and did some research and talked to some people. <clears throat> but then when I started to research uh, the history of it and found out that the kind of father of the uh, blood bank was a black man um, who at the time that he created the blood banks would not have been able to donate blood because they were segregating blood. Um, it really sh struck me as like, wow, there's like no area of American culture which has not been uh, pervaded by uh, racism. Um, and, you know, you would think that like life and death <laughs> would be there's a I think I write a scene in there like a hypothetical scene where there's a guy on a war field and he's dying because he's wounded and and they're like yeah we got this blood but it's you know it's 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 black blood and he's like I'd rather die than take that black blood and I feel like there are some people who are so kind of caught up in this idea of white supremacy uh, and white superiority and black inferiority that they would actually refuse blood from a black person even if it would save their lives. And I think, you know, if you look at what's happening in our culture right now, it is not that far-fetched that there are many more of those people walking around than we think. Thank you. I have my first question. One of the first questions mm -hmm. is, um, what advice would you give to students of color currently dealing with uh, the current events? I'm not even, there's so many current events going on yeah. and uh, that's a pretty heavy question but if you had any advice that if one of your own students asked you well everybody's zooming right and uh one of the um one of the kind of features of the zoom is the breakout the breakout room i know you probably all are broke out breakout room uh fatigue but i do think there's something to finding a smaller collective of people who are like-minded or not necessarily even like-minded, but who can have a, a dialogue, a discourse and talking to them about it. Cause I think, you know, it's very easy to feel overwhelmed. If you go on social media every day, there's something to lament. And I think sometimes we don't necessarily have the outlet for it. So I would say to find people who are in your peer group, who you can, who, who you can talk to in a kind of breakout room, you know, like a smaller group uh, and not just to talk, but to actually move it towards plans of action. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, right now, you know, obviously we just had National Voter Registration Day, so I hope everyone has done that, but you know, what else can, can we do? Um, and I also think it's important not to feel compelled to, to react in a way that, you know, like everybody doesn't have to, everybody's activism doesn't look the same, right? So I also think that people should think about what they're interested in, what they have access to, what they're capable of, and then figure out ways to kind of address whatever kind of in inequities or inequalities that they think they can address. And don't feel like you're not, you're incapable, or you're, you're, you're inefficient if you, if yours doesn't match up with someone else's. Um, Cause I think now, especially in the era of social media, like there's a lot of pressure on people to speak up, to do it fast and to be very vocal. And, uh, and, and maybe, and that works for some people, but maybe some people need a little more time to process, or maybe some people, you know, do things behind the scenes. So I think there, are, we need a lot of different people doing stuff, 
But I would say at the kind of base level is you need to be able to have a dialogue with someone who you can kind of bounce ideas off and sometimes just vent. Thank you. Uh, I agree with all of those. And uh, I've been trying to do that in my coursework. I'm sure all my colleagues have too, or will in the future. Uh, yeah. Moving, staying on a student focused uh, conversation here. One of the questions from Jennifer Macias, one of my colleagues, is how would you want to see or how have you seen your books being used within the classroom? Uh, not necessarily literature classrooms, whether in other fields such as history, and how would you want those books, your books used, especially your second book? Yeah, well, uh, it, it, it didn't, it, 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 when I was writing it, it felt like I was only going to make it into a creative writing classroom, um, even though there was an enormous amount of research that went into um, survival math. And I'm very thankful that it, to me, it's, it's maybe, maybe the biggest compliment that has been paid to me is that it has made it into a history classroom. Um, and it, it's encouraging to me, but one of the things that I think that I was trying to do was uh, trying to take a very serious subject and write it like my uncle would tell it to me. Mm -hmm. So it's like how, like sometimes when I read like a kind of classical history book, the language of that history book, even though I'm very interested in the ideas, the language of the history book feels like it is not directed at me. And so I was trying to direct my writing, the voice of my um, book at the young people. Like I always say I'm writing for like a younger version of myself. And, and, and so it's almost like a friend or like a, a cool uncle or something kind of giving you this information. And so to me, I would hope that there is room for that, space for that in the conversation with, with you know, more like kind of, you know, the, the biography of Frederick Douglass can be alongside this, right? Where there's this kind of um, conventional academic voice and then also this other voice, but that this wouldn't be penalized is not serious or marginalized because it is not using that voice. And to me, uh, voice is so much a part of our history, right? Like when I'm, whatever kind of diction I'm using is a product of my his, my experience, which is, you know, a life history. So um, I want to expand the language, I think, and expand the voice that is a part of you know, the kind of real history record. Thank you. Um, I, I agree with you completely. And I myself could totally see assigning your book if I teach U.S. West history. I try to take in a um, local or regional uh, approach to such a class to connect mm -hmm. with students. And I can think of very few books that cover Oregon like your book. So I could totally see it being assigned in history classes in the state for a long time. Uh, yeah. One question that another colleague posed was that a lot of the history of exclusion in Oregon and why Oregon has such a small black population, uh, there's almost a myth that pushes this history back to the 1800s that says because black people were excluded from Oregon for these decades, uh, the population is so small, yet we've had a century of <laughs> there being right. no exclusion. Uh, so what do you think Oregon or Portland or a university in Oregon can do to be more welcoming to people of color, specifically black people, and thus not necessarily be the white monolith that it is right now? I mean, we can see cities like Seattle or Vancouver in the Pacific Northwest that were once a white monolith, but are right currently global cities with people from all over the globe that are really diverse. Um, you know, I think that the, well, it's marketing, right? So we're saying like, what can a university or a city do? And to me, the greatest marketing tool for the kind of explosion of Portland in the last, I guess, maybe 10 to 15 years is, um, oh man, why am I drawing a blank on it? Portlandia, <laughs> right? So when people 
from outside of Portland think of Portland, they instantly think of Portlandia. And that is a show that is portraying Portland as a place of monolithic whiteness and all this kind of quirkiness. And, uh, and I think, well, that's, if that's the marketing tool, then that's who's going to come, right? Like you go, they're, they're pointing it at a certain group of people. So I think if we actually wanted to have a more diverse uh, population, we would need to change the marketing. So there would need to be a black Portlandia. Like, I don't know what that would look like, but there would, you know, there would need to be a native Portlandia. Like we would need to have um, a kind of national identity that showed diversity, showed uh, a, a kind of um, a, an objective of bringing you know, other people into this community. I think that when people talk about, you know, the 1859, I mean, that is the, it's the, it's the founding, but it's also been the ethos of Oregon for all of this time. Like the ethos hasn't changed. So no, we haven't had exclusion laws, but we don't even need the exclusion laws anymore because the ethos is being uh, kind of uh, disseminated in all of these other ways, right? Like if I watch Portlandia, I'm not, if I'm a black man and I'm watching Portlandia, I, like Portland is the last place I want to move to. <laughs> That's, uh, I, I do remember seeing the show when I didn't live in Oregon and it, it, <laughs> it, it was different than any other place in the United States that I've been to yeah. just judging from the show. Um, and you definitely don't need those exclusion laws for, I'm thinking of New England. There were no exclusion right. laws in Maine and New Hampshire yet. They have right. about the same diversity as Oregon, if not less. Um, mm -hmm. it, one question that came up um, is if you had any other suggestions, any whether they were memoirs or approachable histories um, that you've read regarding Oregon or regarding Portland that you would suggest oh. to professors to assign within our classrooms. Oh, regarding Oregon. Oh, man. Uh, I mean, I would start with, uh, I, I was, I would start with Daryl Milner. Um, he was a black, he's a black historian. He's retired. I think professor emeritus at Portland State University. And he was one of the first people I think who really started writing about the black presence in Oregon. And, uh, so I would say to, I don't know, I can't offhand think of the titles of his books, but I would. Uh, start there. Um, I also think there is um, a YA writer. Um, she's not a historian, um, but Renee Watson is also a Portlander. And I think if you want to, again, in the same way that kind of residue years is a kind of a primary resource, I think there's, she has like, I think four books um, and also writing about Portland. So I think you could go there. Um, there's a documentary, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the name of it, but it ran on OPB about the history of Black Portland or Black Oregon, maybe it is. Um, and uh, there was a great exhibit that was at the down, what's the museum down in the park blocks? Uh, Oregon Historical Society. Um, on uh, Blacks in Oregon. So uh, that is gone, but I'm sure whoever um, the historians that work there can kind of point you in the right direction. So I can't, the, the like book titles are not jumping out at me, but I think those are resources to go and they will lead you to uh, the books that you need. Uh, we're running low on time now, but I did want to ask you uh, as a capstone to the to our conversation, if you mm -hmm. could tell us about your next book project that I'm looking forward to reading uh, in a yeah. year or two down the road, <laughs> whenever it's out. Uh, if you could tell us year your, or two. <laughs> your planned title or sooner. <laughs> yeah. No, no, lo <laughs> much longer. <laughs> if, um, you you know, us, uh, uh, if you could tell us the title, if you could tell us your, if you have any personal connection to it and just the history behind yeah. it. Absolutely. 
So uh, I am committed to writing stories that are grounded in Portland. I'm only writing about home. Uh, you know, you can quote me on that. Uh, what, what did uh, what did one of the senators say? You can quote me on that, and <laughs> <laughs> and then he. <laughs> um. So my next book is called John of Watts, and uh, it is a story about a black man who grew up in Watts but came to play basketball at the Pacific University, and then he went back home and started a group that he. Uh, wanted to uh, a group that he was using to uh, train um, children to be elite athletes because he thought that was going to help them escape poverty. Uh, the group kind of, not kind of, it changed uh, and became what many people call the cult. And then his daughter was, uh, children were being abused. His daughter was one of them and she was killed. And then the cult, the cult was people went to jail and it was disbanded. And so I know people that were in the cult as, uh, as young people. And uh, because it had this Oregon connection, they actually, his daughter was beaten and killed in Oregon. So they came, the cult came to Oregon in the mid 1980s and lived in Sandy, Oregon and in Clackamas. Uh, it was called Ecclesia if anyone wants to look it up. And um, yeah, but, but one of the really interesting things is I wanted to write a, a really long prologue. I actually wanted to write a novella length prologue to open the book uh, because I had saw some some footage of this man who I based the story on and he talked about his him watching the Watts riots of 19 or the Watts revolt of 1965 and uh, and once I uh, sorry um, I'm trying to get rid of something uh, once I saw that I, I just went uh, I just was enamored with the, the, the revolt. And so I ended up doing a lot of research on it. So I ended up writing a history of how black people got to LA. Uh, and so my, my, my prologue is a novella length prologue. It's a hundred page prologue. And it starts with um, the very first black people to come to LA. It actually starts with the founding of LA, which you know, I'm sure were Mexicans who uh, came to LA and named the city. Um, and so um, that I think is also building on the work that I did with Jim Marcus is very much I like I couldn't have wrote this novella length opening without having done Jim Marcus and I could not have wrote Jim Marcus without having wrote uh, survival math and I could not have wrote survival math without having first wrote uh, the residue year. So again, it, to me, it's like it's building and then it's also so much. I mean, I spent a whole year researching uh, or at least nine months researching the revolt. Uh, and I, I feel like a little baby historian now. So I want to thank all you all because I know how much hard work it is that you do. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today. I personally really enjoyed the conversation and I'm sure everyone else did too. We're glad to have you in Oregon through screen. Um, <laughs> yeah. And hopefully soon enough, you'll be able to come back home. Uh, Go be IRL. <laughs> uh, for now, we're going to turn back our screen to the first shot and tell you about our future events. And thank you so much for being with us. Hi, I'm just making sure we have the um, screen share on for coming events. Uh, all right, hopefully people have that screen share. And um, thank you so much, Mitch. That was so, so almost cathartic, I would say. And all I can, um, add is I, I'm really, really uh, apologetic to the questions that we didn't get to, um, especially it sounded like some coming from students, young people, community members, um, because they were, they were really seeking some guidance and there's just so many questions and so many interesting things to talk about that. Um, so I apologize to those. Um, I'm thinking maybe some students and community members. Um, I'm hopefully maybe there's some way you can reach out to Mitch. I, I, I do know that he's on social media. so. Um, that's uh, just one suggestion if you feel like you didn't get your question answered in the time that we had. And I just wanted to, um, you know, press my, uh, um, express my gratitude towards Mitch and Joel and Marisa um, for that great interview and greeting that it's just so revealing and talking about topics, gentrification, organ history, 
all these things are so important to us right now and things we really need to know about. Um, so I'm very, very grateful. And I just wanted to um, end just by mentioning some other events we have coming up in this same series. Um, so our next one is October 6th at 4 p.m. And um, this is uh, Connecting Religion and Music in, um, by uh, Professor Yusef Carter, who is a fellow at UNC. And then we have um, a professor of history from Auburn University, Austin McCoy, on uh, October 21st, who's going to talk about police violence in the 70s and the present in a particular um, uh, movement called Stress, which was, uh, is going to be very relatable to current situation. And then we have a colleague of mine, November 10th at 4 p.m., um, talking about a deeper history, kind of what I mentioned at the beginning of um, African diaspora community building. And then um, we just have a, a couple of tentative talks for winter and spring um, going forward. Um, so this is just a quick preview, but um, uh, I wanna just quickly go back to my contact information that you can see here. And I'd be really happy to receive any emails from anybody who has any questions about this series or about any of our programs, you can contact me directly by that email that you can see there. So please go ahead and contact me. Um, and I really appreciate everybody coming in, especially our visitor, Mitch Jackson. Thank you so much. <laughs>